Welcome everybody to the online seminar series, Machine Learning Needs Mathematical Optimization. So we have today the pleasure of having Ivana Lubik. She is a full professor in operations research at the ESSEC Business School in France. And prior to that, she was uh, at the University of Vienna and she has also held uh, visiting positions at different universities such as University of Maryland, TU Dortmund, TU Berlin, etc. So her research interests include combinatorial optimization, optimization under uncertainty and bi-level optimization. And she has worked in uh, many uh, applications such as network design, telecommunications, transportation, logistics, routing, and bioinformatics. She has published in leading journals in our fields such as operation research, management science, mathematical programming, an European Journal of Operational Research. And she is also very involved with editorial work, being um, in the uh, advisory board of journals such as European Journal of Operational Research, Computers and Operations Research, and associate editor for journals such as Transportation Science Networks, Journal of Global Optimization, and Omega. She has also received uh, numerous uh, research grants from um, councils in France, in Austria, and also from the European Commission. We are very pleased of having you today, Ivana. The floor is yours. And for the audience, please remember uh, the way that we usually run it. So if you have very, very urgent questions during the presentation, please put them in the chat. And otherwise, we will uh, have time for a Q&A session towards the end. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dolores, for this invitation. It's a great pleasure to contribute to this uh, line of talks uh, about uh, machine learning that needs mathematical optimization indeed. Uh, my talk today will be devoted to a special class of problems which are related to maximization of submodular functions. We will look into problems where we have concave utility functions, which are combined with set union operators. This is a special class of discrete optimization problems for which we have developed several branch and cut approaches, and we will study them from the theoretical and computational perspective today. I want first to, to mention that this is a joint work with my colleagues uh, Stefano Cornelio, who is now a professor in Bergamo, and Fabio Furini, who is now at the University of La Sapienza in Rome. Uh, and this is a fresh new work that we have just published in the journal of uh, mathematical programming. So before we start, uh, let's first see or let's refresh our knowledge about what is submodular maximization. We will focus on the so-called set functions, which are functions that uh, map subsets from the given ground set into scalar values. So we are given a ground set uh, of elements. Let's say this is a set N. And then we look at all possible subsets of this set. For every possible subset, we can assign a value. And this mapping H is called a set function. Now, if we want to find a subset that maximizes this function h subject to some constraints, and this function h is a submodular function, then we talk about submodular maximization problems. These type of problems are in general anti-hard and very difficult to solve. Now, now, everything is nice, but I still didn't tell you what is a submodular function. So the function is called submodular if it satisfies this property here. So let's try to understand this property clearly. Let us assume that we are given two sets, S and T. So S is a subset of T. And there is an additional element, J, which is neither in S nor in T. Now we are looking into a contribution of adding an element J into the set S and evaluate evaluation. And then we evaluate the function H on this set. The difference that we he see here on the left-hand side is what we call a marginal contribution of adding element a j into the set S. Typically, we will denote it with rho j of S. And if the contribution of adding an element j 
into a smaller set is larger than the contribution of adding the element J into a larger set, is greater than adding it to an element of a larger set, then we say that the function H is submodular. So in other words, for any subset S and T such that S is contained in T and J is outside of S and T, we will say that uh, if the property that rho j of s is greater or equal than rho j of t holds, then the function h is submodular. Now, we will illustrate this with a simple example. We will use for this the set union operator to see what is happening here. So let us assume that we are given a network that looks uh, like this. We are given objects that we will call meta items and they will correspond the ground set that we are considering will be the set of meta items and there will be the elements with squares here so we will have eight squares eight possible squares and now each of these squares can cover certain uh, other objects that are represented here as items as circles and so if we activate for example square two it will be able to cover these four elements, 7, 10, 9, and 13. So with this network structure, we are able to represent a covering relationship. And we will say that certain meta items are capable of covering some items. And um, if we now consider a subset S of two meta items, if we activate them, you can imagine that these are, for example, some antennas that you can install in your neighborhood or some sensors. So if you want to install an antenna at location six and location eight, you will be able to cover the red items, the items depicted with red color. If on top of that, now you consider activating an additional sensor, let's say the, the green one, then the marginal contribution of adding the element 4 to the set 6 and 8 is measured by the value of these two additional items that you can cover. So marginal contribution of S, including item 4, into the set S will be 2. If we now consider a larger set T, namely we take S, the previous two, plus an additional sensor, which we activated meta item two, then this set covers many more elements, right? They are all now depicted in red. And if we now consider adding the meta item four to the set T, then the marginal contribution of adding four will be only one, because only one green element, which was uncovered by the set T, will be included in the action. So what we can see is indeed that for, for, for this type of operators, we have this property of diminishing marginal gains or diminishing marginal contributions. And this is precisely how we can define submodular functions. Okay. So indeed in our, in our talk, we will now focus on this type of, of problems. We will look into these set union operators, but on top, of, of measuring the value uh, of covering using the set union operators, we will apply additional um, uh, utility function, which will be concave strictly increasing function, which will help us to model behavior of risk averse decision makers who will not just look into pure measure of how many, uh, for example, the items, in this case, if these are households or customers, how many customers are we covering with our set, with, with the choice of meta items, but we will also look into the utility of this coverage. And this can be uh, different than the pure, pure demand or the pure value that we want to cover. So where do we see applications of uh, submodular maximization uh, in the real life? One of the most uh, famous examples is the problem of finding a subset of influencers in a social network such that uh, we can uh, maximize the spread of the information in this network. So typically, what we would like to find is a subset of key players, 
we have just a limited budget, so we want to find a subset of K of them, or if we are giving them some incentives so that they can send out the information through the network in the digital marketing examples. So we want to find a small subset of influencers that will be triggered and that will start propagating the information, certain kind of information in the network. This subset of influencers should be chosen in such a way that uh, the number of users that can be reached or the utility related to the users that we can reach by spreading the information in the network can be maximized. Since these type of networks are typically probably probabilistic networks, we do not have a single scenario, a single network to deal with, but instead what we typically do is we sample different realizations of this network. And then for each of these realizations, we uh, prop imitate the propagation process. In the end, what we want to figure out is the subset of influencers, the subset of key players that we should activate in such a way that the expected utility or the expected number of users uh, that we can reach by triggering this process is maximized. Okay, so another example comes from the facility location problems, where, as we have mentioned, for example, if you think of these locations as locations where you would like to place cameras, sensors, or antennas, each of them has a certain radius of coverage. And what we would like to achieve is, again, with the given limited budget, find the optimal locations of these objects where we should place them in such a way that the coverage that we can obtain is maximized. This coverage now could be uh, the demand, the expected demand, or the revenue, again, that can be measured in terms of the utility function that we can use. Of course, instead of antennas or sensors, we can also think of uh, other uh, typical facility facilities that we would like to locate, such, like, uh, such as fire stations, ambulances, hospitals, factories, and so on. And in the machine learning, when we think of submodular maximization, then uh, we typically measure with the submodular function uh, relevance or diversity of the data set which is given. So if you think of uh, of, your, of a typical application on your telephone, you went, for example, to four vacations and you have collected maybe 1,000 of images, and now your telephone will propose you a nice album with a selection of maybe 20, 30, 40 images that should be the most representative images of your vacation. So how do you choose this most representative subset out of a large set of data that you have well, this subset should be diverse enough, you should avoid redundant information, and it should be representative enough so that you cover most of the nice experiences that you've had during your vacation. Similarly, if you think of recommender systems, uh, when you wish to recommend uh, to, the, to the user certain content or provide some uh, advertisement, uh, you have a limited space on, on the web browser, and with this limited space, which corresponds to your limited budget, you wish to select a well-diversified subset of items that should be given to the user. Uh, finally, if you think of conducting certain experiments, again, which kind of the, in these experiments are very expensive to be conducted. Again, you have a subset selection problem. Choose a subset of experiments such that they should cover most of the information that you will wish to gather subject to a limited budget. Okay, so here is exactly mathematical definition of the problem that we will be studying today. So here is our set of meta items. This is uh, the ground set N. And now each meta item, as you can see, for example, meta item one covers objects one and two. And meta item three covers objects one, three, uh, six, and seven. 
So for simplicity, let us just for a moment assume that we are given a cardinality constraint. And then from the set of meta items, we wish to choose k of them. Let's say we wish to choose two of them. So if we select the item one and item three, we will be covering elements one, two, uh, six, and seven. Now, each of these elements carries some value. And this could be the demand, or this could be some kind of revenue which is associated to these elements. And this is, this is given with the weight A. Okay. So if once we choose the subset of meta items, we look at the items which are covered, and then we look at the value of these items. And finally, this value of these items will be measured with the function Q. So the function Q is actually the weighted set union operator, where these values will be non-negative numbers. And finally, as in this case of the influence maximization, maybe these networks, these bipartite graphs that we have here are probabilistic, which means that we might wish to sample many examples of them. And in the end of the day, we will look at the expected value of, of, the, of the utility function that we will get by choosing the subset as head of meta items. So PI are the probabilities. IM is the set of possible scenarios. S hat is the chosen subset of meta items that we will be covering. And N of S hat will be the subset of covered items for the given choice of S hat. So this is the optimization problem that we will be looking at. And we will try to solve it using the techniques of mixed integer linear programming. More formally, Let's see. So again, this is our definition. So n of s hat will denote the set union of operator. This will be all the items that we can cover by choosing meta items of s hat. We have discrete set of scenarios, each of them with probability pi. And we have a utility function. As I said, the utility function will just um, uh, describe the risk averse attitude of the decision maker. And typically, these functions uh, are strict reasoning, they are concave, and we will also assume that they are differentiable. So, in typical exact function which is used in many applications in mathematical finance, uh, looks like this. And that's, her, that's the shape of this function, where the value of lambda is the risk averse parameter. So when lambda uh, is increasing, then this function uh, looks more like a linear function. And so for the larger values of lambda, actually, we have a, a decision maker which becomes more risk neutral. And for the smaller values of lambda, always non-negative, of course, we model the higher risk aversion uh, property of the decision maker. So as we said, our objective function is now a composition of the set union operator, which we will describe uh, using this not notation q hat for the scenario i. And that's the value evaluation of this set union, weighted set union at the set s hat. And so we have a combination, a composition of the utility function f and the set union operator q. The new function that we will denote by h is a submodular function as well. And also, our overall problem, which is a linear combination, a non negative linear combination of submodular functions, is submodular as well. And so, for the ease of exposition, I will just assume for the moment that we are that we have here cardinality constraints. However, as you will see later, our method can work with arbitrary set of constraints on the set of meta items that we are choosing, as long as we can describe them using a linear set of inequalities using polyhedra. OK, so how can we deal with maximization? What are the two typical uh, approaches to deal with the maxima maximization of submodular functions? In the operations research world, let's say, a typical approach is uh, the one which relies on uh, branch and cut method, 
uh, which is developed based on the very, very, uh, very old results, let's say 45 years old results from Nemhauser, Wilson, Fisher, uh, which uh, describe the properties of submodular functions. And in particular, the, with, with the properties that have been given in, in this seminal paper, one can derive uh, an ILP formulation in the space of meta items, in the, in the space of variables associated to meta items with just a single uh, auxiliary variable W. So if we look into the problem, in, into a generic problem in which we want to maximize the function, the function age uh, of S, where age is a submodular function with uh, cardinality constraints, we can model this problem uh, as an ILP as follows. We will introduce an auxiliary variable W and we will replace the value of the objective function with these two types of constraints. So the first type of constraints say the following. It has to be imposed, first of all, for any subset of, of the elements of the ground set. And um, uh, if, the, if the S hat is the optimal uh, objective function value, or F S hat is the optimal solution, then W should, not, should be at least less frequent than H of S hat. Otherwise, we provide an overestimator of the value of W, and we say the following. Uh, if we add into the S hat an element which is currently not included in this set, then the value of the objective function can increase at most by the marginal contribution of J with respect to the set S hat. So it is giving us an upper bound. Otherwise, if we consider removing an element from S hat, then the value of the objective function should decrease at least by the marginal contribution of the element S with respect to the whole set of meta items. So the, the constraints 1B in principle are sufficient to describe the, the optimization problem and to find the optimal solution, but the Nemhauser, Wolsey, and Fisher, they also show that the second property holds as well. And so we can combine the constraints 1B and 1C to get a tighter model. The second type of constraints says something similar, but it says the following. Either age of S hat is the optimal solution, or the objective function value can increase by at most the marginal contribution of element J with respect to the empty set, or decrease at least by the marginal contribution of J with respect to the S hat without J. So this approach, which uh, th this model requires solving the problem using a branch and cut procedure or dynamic cut generation approach. This means that um, of the worst case running time of solving such a model can be exponential. But, so this is the, this is the contra-argument for, for, for using it, but it has also some uh, very nice uh, properties. And actually, this is something that uh, we are going to exploit uh, in our approach as well. First of all, the approach can provide very high, high quality solutions or even optimal solutions, even for instances of very large size. And if not, if we terminate because of the time limit, then of course, we will always get also some certificate of, uh, of the quality of, with respect to, of this solution with respect to the upper bounds, dual upper bounds. Moreover, as you can see here, uh, we, we say that the vector y, which is supposed to be an incidence vector of the optimal solution, which means we have a one-to-one -one correspondence between the vector y and any possible subset of meta items. So this set Y is actually a polyhedron, which is supposed to, to describe the, proper, the desired properties of optimal solution. So in the simplest possible case, we can say vector Y, y the, the set polyhedron Y models the cardinality constraints. 
but the polyhedron Y can contain much, much more. And the, the once you have implemented the, the, the cutting planes and the separation of constraints 1B and 1C, it really doesn't matter uh, or it doesn't really affect uh, your implementation. How do you describe the set Y? It could be uh, instead of the cardinality constraint, it could be a budget constraint, it could be partitioning constraint, or even something more. For example, if we think of these uh, antennas, examples of antennas or sensors that we wish to, to install in the network, maybe we, we want them to be connected between each other, and then this set Y could also model connectivity constraints and much more. So this is one approach. So this approach uh, gives us exact solutions in the best case and otherwise gives us a, a feasible, hopefully high quality solution and a dual upper bound, which gives us also a gap, duality gap uh, for, for, the, for the obtained solution. What is the alternative? An alternative which is quite frequently used in the theoretical computer science literature is, uh, relate, is based on greedy heuristic, which is a polynomial time heuristic, also proposed by Nenhauser, Wilson, and Fisher, uh, and the, the, which runs as follows. We start with an empty set of items, and then so for the k iterations, until we meet the cardinality constraint, so if uh, that should be 1, 2k, we are adding uh, one by one the meta items with the largest margin of contribution with respect to the set S hat that we have built so far. So in the first iteration, we add an element with the largest margin of contribution with respect to the empty set, then with the largest margin of contribution with respect to this single tone that we have added and so on until we add K elements. So clearly, such a heuristic is very easy to implement. It runs in polynomial time. And uh, these are great advantages compared to the branch and cut approach that I have mentioned before. However, with respect to the quality of obtained solutions, there is no guarantee uh, clearly that uh, these solutions will be of very high quality. And actually, only for some very special cases, uh, we can provide approximation guarantees. So already in the same paper in 78, uh, it has been shown that uh, if we are given a K cardinality constraint, and if the function age is monotone, then this greedy approach guarantees that the solution obtained by the greedy heuristic will have a, will be uh, in the worst case, one minus one over E, Time over, far away from the optimal solution. Well, this means that in the worst case, the solution will be 35%, up to 35, a little bit more percent, uh, far from the optimum. And similarly, if the NEPS constraint is considered, greedy, not this greedy heuristic, but a more advanced algorithm provided by Siridenko in 2004, also shows that we can get, reach this approximation factor. If instead we say that the set of uh, meta items that we are considering uh, is partitioned into several, uh, several groups of meta items and out, out of each group we can choose at most uh, K, uh, K1, K2, Kp, then the best we can get is actually approximation factor of uh, one half. Moreover, these bounds of these approximation algorithms uh, are shown to be tight, which means that there exist really instances for which these factors are achieved uh, as asymptotically achieved, which means as the number of meta items grows large, asymptotically we reach these values. So these are the disadvantages of the greedy approach compared to the exact one. Now, what we wanted to do is, well, it was to somehow combine the best of the two worlds. And one thing that uh, we can do is, of course, we can always take the solution of the greedy algorithm and start with this solution as a feasible solution that we feed to the branch and cut soap. But more than that, we also didn't want to solve, uh, to use this basic formulation 
uh, which is based on submodular cuts to solve our problem. We wanted to exploit the, the fact that our objective function is based as a composition of a con concave increasing utility function and the set union operator. So I will show you in a second how we can do that. I just want to point out that this place also that these submodular cuts, they are used in the, in the operations research literature, but they're also known to be not very strong. This is why also in the OR literature, many authors have tried to lift the coefficients, which are here shown uh, as the marginal contributions, and to provide stronger cuts. And this lifting is typically related to the fact, uh, related to the description of the polyhedron Y. So these special liftings have been proposed by Sabir Ahmed, uh, Atam Turk, uh, and colleagues, in particular when the set Y is uh, uh, given uh, as a cardinality constraint or when the set Y represents actually a budget constraint, a general budget constraint. So once again, as a summary, so we are, this is the basic uh, submodular cut formulation, which we can apply to our problem, but we are going to do a little bit more. And so what are we going actually to do? We call it a double hypograph reformulation of the problem. And if we start again by looking into our problem, what we have here is, uh, is a, a very compact formulation in which we just say we wish to find a subset, a binary vector, y. So we wish to find a subset s hat, which will be encoded with y, such that we maximize this objective function. So here is what, where we see the composition of two functions, f and the qi. Now, qi is actually giving us the value of the set union operator once we fix the vector why once we decide which meta items we want to activate so if we represent this problem using the double hypograph reformulation we will introduce auxiliary variables eta and so and auxiliary variables w so we will replace the value of the objective function with w and at the optimum uh, we will, because of the maximization, we will make sure that wi for each scenario i will be equal to f of eta. And now eta, again, plays the same role as w here. So eta at the optimum should be precisely equal to q of y. So what we did here is just a reformulation where we are now invoking the value functions, value of f and value of q, on the right hand side. Uh, and so these are parametric problems that we would like to uh, convexify somehow. The function phi, uh, f, sorry, is, is a concave function. It's a, it's a differentiable. And so we, we can simply outer approximate the function phi. This is one of the first part of our approach that we are going to do. And it turns out that the function q which is the set union operator and the weighted set union operator can also be represented as a piecewise concave uh, function. And there are two ways to represent it. One is uh, obtained by using Bender's cuts and the other one is obtained by using submodular cuts representation. So based on this idea, we will end up with two decomposition approaches. One we will call outer approximation plus Bender's cuts, and the other one we call outer approximation plus submodular cuts. Okay, so let's have a look, closer look now. How is this going to happen? So it is not difficult to see that we can replace constraints uh, that we call hypo one and hypo two uh, with the following one in which we are outer approximating the function f using the first order approximation, okay? So instead of writing eta, we just write q, and uh, this will be the type of cuts that we would obtain instead of hypo one and hypo two. 
Now, if you look at these constraints, this is just rewriting of, of these cuts, it, you might uh, have an impression that we have here to deal with a semi-infinite uh, uh, formulation. However, this is not the case. Even though the values of P can, in theory, take uh, values from this continuous interval, we are only interested in approximating the function Q at a discrete set of points. This is because we are dealing here with a discrete optimization problem, and hence it is sufficient to uh, give the approximation of Q of Y in these uh, finite number of points. And hence, we will have a finite number of cutting planes to describe this problem. Now, we still have to do with the value function qi of y. And qi of y, remember, is going to tell us about the coverage of the items once we have selected the meta items represent whose incidence vector is given by the vector y. So we can either say that we can use two, two, two properties. One is the submodularity property of this set union operator. And the other property is the fact that the value of qi of y can be also represented as this linear program, which, is, which we call the maximum coverage linear program. Now, you may say uh, that I wrote here the maximum coverage linear program but it is written here as an ILP, but let's have a closer look into what we are describing here. So what we say is the following. Assume that we have chosen a set of meta items, which corresponds, so the Y hat is the incidence vector of the set S hat of meta items. And once these meta items are chosen, then we wish to want to figure out what is the coverage that we get by, by this choice of meta items. So the vector x, the vector x is a 0, 1 a vector in the space of items where we try to maximize the value of aijxj plus di, uh, which is, if you remember, i is just a given scenario, and aj for the given scenario i just gives us the demand of the item J or the revenue of the item J. So it's the weighted set union value that we will get. And how to model the set union operator? Well, we will say that the item J is covered if and only if at least one of the meta items from its neighborhood is activated. So it looks like an ILP, but in fact, it's a linear program because without loss of generality, we can relax this condition and we will get a linear program. Not only that, but the optimal solution of this linear program can be found by inspection. We don't have to solve a linear program, even if the values of Y are fractional values. Now, what are we going to do is, in order to describe, to derive a concave, piecewise concave uh, description of the function qy, we are going to look into the dual of this optimization problem. And by using the strong LP duality, we will derive the so-called Vendor's cuts for the problem. And this uh, uh, finite but exponential family of Vendor's cuts will give us the description of the set qi of y. So the first approach, as we said, is based on the submodularity property. And so we will, we will simply use the fact that the function qi is per se submodular. And hence, now we can use the submodular cuts that we have seen at the beginning of the presentation. So that would be one possible way to describe the, the function Q. And the other one, as I mentioned, is based on the Bender decomposition. So instead of, because the strong LP duality holds, we can describe it as a minimization of the dual problem. And we, it is sufficient to focus on the extreme points of the dual of the polyhedron describing this problem, which does not depend on y anymore. And hence, we will get a finite 
but exponential set of inequalities that we refer to as Bender's cuts. So for each scenario and for each extreme point of the dual, we will invoke one constraint of this type. Okay, now we have to go back into our decomposition approach. What, remember what we had here was uh, the fact that on the left-hand side, we use the outer approximation of the, of the uh, function f. And on the right-hand side, we had the function q that now we were able to uh, overestimate uh, and to approximate either using the submodular constraints or using the Bender's decomposition. Putting this all together for the case when we combine, combine outer approximation with Bender's decomposition, this is a valid MILP formulation that we obtain. So we introduce auxiliary variables W for each scenario. And as we said, on the left-hand side, we keep the outer approximation of the function f. And on the right-hand side, we impose the Bender's cuts. Now, for each scenario and for each extreme point of the uh, Bender's dual subproblem, and now we say again for each p from this interval. But using the same arguments as before, we don't have a semi-continuous, a semi-infinite uh, reformulation but the, it is sufficient to look into the points P that correspond to binary vectors from this polyhedron. So we have a finite set of constraints in this case. And another uh, interesting and important result is that when we look at this outer approximation with Bender's decomposition, the separation of these inequalities can be done in linear time provided that we can calculate the function f and f prime in constant time. And this separation is done in linear time, even for fractional solutions y hat. In a similar way, by replacing the right-hand side, instead of using Bender's cuts, by replacing it with submodular cuts, we will get a formulation that we will denote with OA plus SC, standing for outer approximation with submodular cuts. Okay, so here are these three formulation, reformulations that we now can consider to solve our problem. The first one is the standard submodular cut reformulation in which we just exploit the fact that the composed function, remember H hat refers to F composed with the set union operator, is submodular. The second two are our double decomposition approach. The first one where we replace the right-hand side with submodular cuts, and the second one where we replace the right-hand side with Bender's cuts. Now, an interesting question would be, how do these formulations compare against each other in terms of the strength of the LP relaxation? And uh, what we have been able to show is the following. For the submodular cuts of type 1 combined with outer approximation, we were able to show that there are precisely the same cuts contained within the family of Bender's cuts, so there is an equivalence. With respect to the basic formulation, under certain conditions, the cuts from the basic formulations based on submodular cuts can be stronger than the combined ones and the other way around. However, for the second family of cuts, we were able to show that the Bender's cuts strictly dominate the submodular cuts of the second type, which means that by solving OA plus BC, we will typically get a better LP relaxation bound than by solving this one. Okay, and now let's move, let's move to the experiments. We have experimented with four branch and cut algorithms. The first one based on this, what I call basic formulation. Then we have our two decomposition approaches. And the fourth one is our decomposition approach with Bender's cuts, where we, in addition to separating integer points, we also separate fractional points as well. 
We use the very large uh, benchmark set of instances. We had 24,000 instances in total. And as I said, we did not only focus on the k-cardinality constraints, but we also considered instances where the set y uh, contains NEPSA constraints or the partition maturing constraints or the conflict constraints. So let me just tell you that with respect to the sub number of meta items, we considered 40, 50, and 60 meta items. If you think of influence maximization problem, that means that we were considering sets of 40 to 60 potential uh, key players with 50 and 100 scenarios and with, uh, 5, 000, with social networks with 5,000 up to 20,000 potential users. And uh, we looked into Euclidean distances, so we were sampling the points in the Euclidean plane, and then we considered the coverage relationship defined uh, as uh, with respect to Euclidean distances with certain radius, which was given like this. And we consider different risk tolerance parameters. And now you can see that for the k-cardinality constraints, we were considering, let's say, out of 40 or 60 influencers, we were choosing 10 or 15. And for the partition matrix constraints, we were saying there are 60 influencers, they are divided into three groups, and out of each group, we can choose at most five. With respect to the conflict constraints, they are very interesting because for them, no constant approx uh, approximation uh, algorithm uh, can be derived. So for the conflict constraints, um, we were assuming that there are certain conflicts so that pairs of, of meta items cannot be chosen at the same time. And this conflict graph was generated as a graph where edge probability of 1% was given pairwise with 1% one per, one of edges were creating the conflict in this network. So here is the first table that uh, shows the summary of the obtained results. So what we show here is the total number of instances. Here are the different categories so that we have tested. And then you can see the performance of the basic model, the two decomposition approaches, and the decomposition approach in which we include the fractional point separation as well. The gap that we show here, we show the number of instances sold to optimality for each of them. But the gap that we show refers only to the instances that were not solved within the time limit of 10 minutes. So 10 minutes is not allowed for, for the branch and cut. And as, as you can see, you, the, the basic formulation gives the worst gaps, solves very few instances to optimality. The ones that were recombined, OA and submodular cuts, improves a lot. The one that, where we use the vendor's cuts on top of it gives even better gaps. And this is, of course, in line with our, our theoretical results that say that vendor's cuts dominate the submodular cuts. But the, very, the best results are obtained by using also the fractional separation, which means you know, that, that we tighten the quality of the, uh, of the lower bound, of the upper bounds, of continuous bounds at the root node by separating fractional points as well. And so you can see that out of 24,000 instances, uh, 1,500 more or less remained unsolved within uh, 10 minutes. And these are the gaps for the instances that remained unsolved. And finally, what we show here with the greedy is that this is the gap for only for those 1,500 instances that remained unsolved with our best uh, approach. So what it shows is that we were able to further improve the feasible solution values uh, compared to the one provided by the greedy algorithm. Uh, here is the performance profile, also showing that the basic formulation performs very badly. So the, the, the higher the curve, the, the better is the performance. And here we see a clear dominance of our decomposition approach of our winner compared to the others. So let me, let me move. So they, 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 we have several several performance profiles that are just uh, partitioned based on the type of instances that we consider. So for the NEPSEC and NEPSEC with conflict, we see again similar behavior. And also for the partition matrix and partition matrix with conflict, we see a similar behavior as well. So let me move to uh, conclusions. So 
What we see is the following. Combining outer approximation for the uh, utility function with either submodular cuts or Bender's cuts pays off when compared to just applying the, band, the, the, the standard basic approach, which would be to take the submodular cuts for the, com for the composition function H. Among the two, we have also seen that Bender's cuts approach substantially outperforms the submodular cuts. And even more, the separation of Bender's cuts at fractional points leads to the best performance among the methods that we have studied. What I didn't cover with this presentation is another contribution, and I invite you to have a look in, into our paper if you're interested, is uh, the approach, the double decomposition approach, which also covers the case when the function f is concave, but not necessarily increasing. In this case, we lose the submodularity property of the function h, but nevertheless, Thanks to this uh, double decomposition approach, thanks to the fact that the function f is still concave and differentiable, we can apply the outer approximation on f. However, for the function q, uh, it is still submodular, but this time, because uh, f is not increasing, we also need to provide underestimators for the function qi, and this can be done using polymatrix constraints and exploiting, again, the submodularity property. OK, what about the future work? So in machine learning, uh, the greedy heuristic is used to solve really large scale problems. What we have seen in our approach so far is that if the set of items that we are covering, which is, could be the set of images or the set of, of users in the social network, can go up to 20,000, maybe we can go up to 100,000 if we are given one hour of, of computing time to the branch and cut approach. But how can we now exploit this exact method, this branch and cut, for much larger instances? This is an open question. Uh, I hope that there will be some future works where we will see the benefit of using branch and cut uh, to, to and leverage this approach for large scale instances. This can be done by using some parallelization or distribution uh, algorithm techniques by combining it with sampling or some mid based greedy heuristics. Finally, we have seen that this double decomposition approach is quite successful when it comes to uh, combination of concave functions with the submodular operator. But then the question is open, what about some other um, submodular functions, not necessarily the set union operator? And finally, I want to draw your attention to uh, the, our code, which is publicly available, and which I hope will also lead to further uh, development of research in this direction. So the code for related to this particular paper is given on the GitHub of Fabio Furini. And the, the related code for the maximal covering location problem, where we have de developed a branch and vendors cut approach, is also available on GitHub as well. So everything is open source. And these are the two papers related to this work. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Ivana, for this very, very interesting presentation. So uh, I open the floor for questions from the audience. So remember that you, if you raise your hand, we will give you the rights to the camera and the speaker. Thank you, Emma. <laughs> I guess that your presentation was very, first of all, very visual and very uh, <laughs> well explained. Um, so uh, if there are not questions from the audience, uh, no, then I think we would uh, like to thank you for, uh, it was very, uh, as I said, very visual and uh, very enjoyable to connect uh, submodularity with uh, 
with machine learning. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dolores. Thanks to all the participants. And yes. And uh, to the audience, remember that next week we will have um, another of the sessions. Um, uh, yes, so you are getting <laughs> many messages from uh, uh, the audience. So we will see you again next week. Yeah.